Chapter 29, Development and Inheritance. So in Chapter 28, we talked about the female and male reproductive system and how the gametes, egg and sperm, were formed. So now that we know those things, we can talk about what happens when the egg and sperm fuse to create an embryo. And of course, that embryo will continue development to become a fetus, and then once born, enter infancy and up through development. So we'll start out by first defining the terms development and differentiation. Development is the gradual modification or change of your physical and physiological characteristics. Differentiation is when we make different types of cells. So there are some stages of development we can divide um, up into and we have first the embryological phase. This is the change that happens during the first two months after fertilization. Fetal begins at the start of the ninth week and continues until birth. Postnatal development begins at birth and continues throughout maturity. So we'll start at the very beginning with fertilization and work our way up through the phases of development. Fertilization, also known as conception, um, has to happen, as we mentioned, in the fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes. It cannot happen in the uterus. It cannot happen within the cervix. It can't happen in the vaginal canal. It has to happen in the fallopian tubes. And this is typically within a day of ovulation. Um, if you remember, ovulation happens around day 14. That is an average, of course. It could be before or after that. But day 14 is our average. Ovulation will happen around day 14, and that is when the egg has released from the ovary and is beginning its passage down the fallopian tube. Sperm cannot fertilize an egg until after capacitation. Now, capacitation is a very mysterious concept. Um, there's not, we don't really fully understand capacitation. Um, it seems that the sperm that come into contact with the female's reproductive system closely undergo a chemical change of some sort and are more likely to have a date with the egg than sperm that do not have this chemical change that we know of as capacitation. Scientists do not fully understand capacitation, nor do we know what chemical changes are happening exactly. But to give you an idea, when after intercourse, after ejaculation, when sperm enter the female's vaginal canal, they move up through the cervix, up into the uterus, and then begin moving down into the fallopian tubes. Out of millions of sperm that enter the woman's body, only 10,000 sperm will make it to the fallopian tubes themselves. And it sounds kind of funny, but there are many sperm that are not too great. There are some that have two heads, some that have two tails, some that swim in circles that we certainly don't want to make it to the egg. So for men, remember, it's about quantity, not necessarily quality. That is not to say that men don't produce good, good healthy sperm cells. It's just to say that the sheer volume of sperm cells that are produced in a man every day, all of them cannot be perfect. So a good many of them will not make it. It's a very treacherous trip. So only about 10,000 make it to the fallopian tubes, and out of that 10,000, only about 100 make it to the egg. So that being the case, the sperm that make it into the fallopian tubes, some of them get caught in the cilia of the fallopian tubes. And the fallopian tubes are lined with cilia, 
that is beating rhythmically to move the egg along the fallopian tube. Sometimes sperm get caught or tangled up in that cilia. Those sperm that get caught in the cilia tend to undergo some sort of chemical change known as capacitation. These guys are released over a period of hours or even days. Um, a sperm can potentially survive in the female's body for up to 72 hours. So you could potentially get pregnant even though intercourse was a couple of days before you actually released your egg. So the fact that they can survive a while, they get caught up in the cilia, undergo a change, could actually enhance the chance of pregnancy. Now this picture here has been included. It's on page 1089 of your textbook. And this is obviously a laboratory situation. Um, a, because we have a picture of it, but also we can see that there are many more than just a hundred sperm around this egg. Um, the reason this picture was included is because I want you to see the major difference in size between the egg and the sperm. Now in this picture here we can see that this egg is huge in comparison to these sperm. The sperm are very, very tiny. And this actually makes a lot of sense because remember, sperm have to make a trip. Um, they need to be small and light and compact. And so as we looked in chapter 28, um, we saw that the sperm, when they are being produced, they grow a flagella and they shed off extra cytoplasm and also extra organelles. So at this point, a sperm is only made up of a head that's filled with chromosomes, a neck filled with mitochondria, and a flagella tail. So the sperm are only carrying dad's DNA. Remember that the sperm are carrying 23 chromosomes from dad, and the egg is furnishing 23 chromosomes from mom. So when the egg and sperm unite, we will have the magic number 46, that is the human chromosome number. So the egg, the sperm is small because it's carrying chromosomes. Its job is to get those chromosomes to the egg. The egg, on the other hand, remember that eggs are made before a woman is ever born, and they lie dormant in the ovaries until she reaches puberty, where she will begin releasing, on average, one a month. So that being the case, each egg is very carefully formed because there are so few of them and they also have to supply all of the main organelles for the developing embryo. Since the sperm is just carrying DNA, the egg is going to supply cytoplasm and, and mitochondria and a lot of those other organelles that are needed for a living cell. So the egg needs to be a lot bigger. It's like a palatial palace for that little sperm. So when the sperm get there, their job is to try to have one sperm make it in and deliver dad's DNA. So we're going to take a look at fertilization using the figure on page 1089 of your textbook. Okay, so in this picture, we're going to start out, actually I would like to start out, I'm going to go forward a couple of slides here. Okay, I've made a picture for you that I'm trying to find. It may be on the desktop, so bear with me one second here. All right, so what I want you to see here, and by the way, if this is, if this is a little bit hazy for you, like I'm, um, <clears throat> if this is a little bit hazy for you, then what I have done actually is not only have I included it here in this presentation, but I also have uploaded this picture to the GMC online uh, site where you print off your outlines. This is now listed under the outlines as uterus figure. So if you would like to, you can print this out and have your very own, have a very own, your very own copy to look at as you go through this chapter. But what I want to show you here um, 
if you can see it. Some of you may be able to and some of you may not, but if you can't, go ahead and pause it, print it out so that you can follow along with me. So in figure A, um, this is a review of what we learned in the last chapter. A typical woman's cycle is 28 days. Okay, so I've drawn 1 through 28 here. Right smack in the middle of 28 days is 14. So we have two weeks that we call pre-ovulation and two weeks that we call post-ovulation. Day 14, ovulation. This is when the egg is actually released. Now again, this is an average. So during pre-ovulation, we talked about um, that's when there's a spike of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and the follicles, primary, secondary, and tertiary follicles develop, release the egg during ovulation, the egg becomes a secondary oocyte and then begins moving through the fallopian tube for a possible chance at fertilization. Now we know that around day 14 when the egg pops out, it will leave behind a corpus luteum which will produce progesterone, hormone that will thicken the uterine lining in preparation for pregnancy or the endometrium will become rich thick and full of oxygen and blood, perfect for a possible implantation of an embryo. So the uterine lining will be thickening up from day 14 towards day 28. If we do not get pregnant on day 28, we should expect our period and we will shed the uterine lining because we don't need it. We didn't get pregnant. Now, if we did get pregnant, we're going to maintain the uterine lining throughout the entire length of the pregnancy and not shed the uterine lining. So over here in figure B, this is, this is most fertile near day 14. Now, I mentioned to you, um, I believe in chapter 28, that day 14 is the average. Some women can ovulate as early as day 10. Some can ovulate on day 16. Um, it's just an average. That being said, the ovulation prediction method is not a safe way of avoiding pregnancy because you cannot be sure that day 14 is the day that the egg will be released. So to be careful about that, we know that it can range anywhere from on average day 10 through day 16, day 14 being the average of that. So in this picture here, what we can see is this is the uterus. And I've labeled here for you, we've got a thick, rich endometrial lining, nice and ready for pregnancy. So intercourse occurs, and we can see the sperm entering the vaginal canal. And these sperm that I drew are way out of scale. They're huge, but you get the idea. The sperm are going to move up into, through the cervix into the uterus and then begin to move down into the fallopian tubes. Now these guys who are going to the right in this instance are going to be very disappointed because there's no egg over here. This ovary is the one who released the egg. The egg pops out and enters the fallopian tube and will move down the fallopian tube for the possibility to meet with a sperm. The corpus luteum is present and is going to thicken the uterine lining in preparation for pregnancy. If that egg is fertilized, then that little fertilized egg will embed itself into the endometrial lining and begin developing an embryo and then a fetus. If the egg does not get fertilized, then our period will begin on day 28 and we will shed the endometrial lining along with the egg that was never fertilized. Now something interesting, while not very attractive sounding, is around day 14 when ovulation occurs and the egg is floating down the fallopian tube, the cervix, the little opening to the uterus, the cervix is actually plugged with a thick mucus. And this mucus is protective. It prevents bacteria from getting into the uterus and causing an infection, and it also can prevent sperm from getting in. So around day 14, when there's a spike of luteinizing hormone, which causes ovulation, that cervical mucus will get very thin and actually sometimes emerge out of the vaginal canal. Some women, are, some women notice it, which is one way they can tell that they're very fertile. 
Um, but the mucus becomes very thin and runny. And again, I know this is just very delightful to hear, but when that happens, it makes little channels through the mucus that allow the passage of sperm to move in and actually enhance the chance of the sperm moving in so that the sperm can move up and hopefully meet with the egg. So this softening of the mucus is actually a woman's body's way of trying to enhance the odds of pregnancy. All right, so we're gonna pick up right around here in this fertilization phase and look at it a little bit closer up. Okay, so again, it has to happen. Fertilization has to happen in the fallopian tubes within a day of ovulation. Okay, so here what we're looking at, this egg has just popped out of the ovary and is beginning its passage down the fallopian tube. Now, we mentioned this, and I gave it to you in a handout in chapter 28 on the ovarian cycle, that once the egg is released, it is suspended in metaphase. And we can see that because the chromosomes are lined up on the metaphase plate there. It's suspended in metaphase, surrounded by the corona radiata, surrounded by the corona radiata, which is a protective shell of cells. Okay, this egg is being very well guarded. This little guy here is the first polar body. Um, polar body is a little sac that holds the extra chromosomes. An egg, just like sperm, an egg starts out with 46 chromosomes, which we cannot have because if the egg had 46 chromosomes and the sperm had 23, Imagine the mess that would make when the two joined. We would have way too many chromosomes. So the egg is actually going to expel the extra 23 chromosomes into this polar body, which will eventually disintegrate. So we're left with just 23 chromosomes only in the egg. So the egg will begin moving down the fallopian tube and will eventually be met by a team of sperm those sperm will begin trying to get in to the egg. Remember that the heads of the sperm are coated with an acrosomal cap. The acrosomal cap on the head of the sperm is made up of acids and enzymes. Those acids and enzymes will dissolve a pathway through the corona radiata so that a sperm can fuse with the egg. Now it's not very fair but there must be the presence of multiple sperm to make this happen. Meaning, if only one sperm made it to the egg, it would not contain enough acids and enzymes itself to burrow a pathway through the egg. We must have multiple sperm releasing all of their enzymes together as a team to make the corona radiata weak enough to allow one sperm to enter the egg. So it's kind of not fair. We're gonna have this whole team working really hard to get, um, to get in, and then only one sperm's actually gonna get in as the result of teamwork, which again, not very fair for the other guys who don't make it. But once we have a weak enough spot, a sperm will enter and as soon as that little sperm head enters that egg moves into lockdown mode um, it's going to immediately depolarize which means it's going to fill with sodium and and calcium this is going to actually harden the outside of the egg and prevent what's called polyspermy which is multiple sperm getting into the egg now again, we'd have a problem if that occurred because we've got 23 chromosomes from mom and if we have two sperm getting in, that's 23 chromosomes in one sperm and 23 chromosomes in another sperm, that's way too many chromosomes. So once one sperm gets in, the egg goes on lockdown which will prevent any other sperm from getting in or what we call polyspermy. So as soon as the sperm penetrates into the egg, 
it will unlock its chromosomes from its little head. Okay, so we can see dad's chromosomes here, mom's chromosomes here in the egg. We call this a little more technically a pronucleus. So we have a female pronucleus, which is mom's 23 chromosomes, a male pronucleus, which is dad's 23 chromosomes. Now the two have not yet mixed, but they're about to. Okay, so when these two meet together, that is called amphimixis, or the mixing of the chromosomes. And once that happens, we have our magic number 46. So when we get the 46, we're on our way to making a human. So amphimixis occurs, and about 30 hours later, we have our very first cell division. So we've gone from a one-celled organism to a two-celled organism on our way to trillion-cell organism. So this next couple of slides is just going to sort of reiterate um, what we just showed. The um, oocyte is in meiosis two, surrounded by the corona radiata. The sperm bombard the egg and release acids and enzymes, specifically hyaluronidase and acrosin. These are enzymes that penetrate the corona radiata. A single sperm contacts the oocyte and fertilization begins. The oocyte will complete meiosis II and is now considered a mature egg. The female pronucleus and male pronucleus fuse in the process known as amphimixis and polyspermy is prevented by membrane depolarization. Okay, so we're going to begin after fertilization with the embryonic and fetal. We'll move into the fetal period. Um, two terms we need to know is first we have induction. Induction is um, what happens during prenatal development. It's when certain genes will trigger changes in the cells. In other words, certain cells will begin to become nervous tissue certain cells will begin to become bone tissue or muscle tissue or endocrine tissue. So we're going to start having differentiation caused by genes. And then we have what's called the gestational period. Um, we probably all know that a pregnancy is typically defined as lasting nine months. If you really do the math, it's closer to 10 months. Um, a full term pregnancy is 40 weeks. Nine months is 36 weeks. So we're creeping up on the 10th month actually when pregnancy ends. Um, it's not quite usually into the 10th month or it certainly doesn't complete the 10th month. So we just typically say nine months. Though that is a very long time and good Lord if you've had a child you know that is a very long time. Um, it could be worse. Elephants actually have a gestational period of two years. Can you imagine? being pregnant for two straight years with the same baby. That would just be a nightmare. So gestational periods, um, again, 40 weeks or nine months, and there are three trimesters, of course, with three months in each trimester. So we would define these as the first trimester, second, and third trimester. Okay, so we're going to begin with the first trimester. Um, the first trimester is really the embryological and very early fetal development. Um, and in this phase, all the rudiments or beginnings of the major organ systems will begin to appear. Um, the first trimester is often defined as the most delicate of the trimesters. This is when the most can go wrong. Um, this, this is usually the phase, one of the phases where um, women tend to feel not so hot. Some women get lucky and feel wonderful the entire time, but the first trimester um, is most commonly associated with nausea and flu-like symptoms, and there's also a higher miscarriage rate in this trimester than the other two. 
So in the first trimester, some of the major things that are going to occur are first cleavage, which is um, division. This is when we have a zygote that becomes a pre-embryo and then what we call a blastocyst. Um, I'll show you pictures of this. And then implantation where the blastocyst burrows into the endometrium. Placentation, um, this is when we form a placenta that surrounds the blastocyst. And embryogenesis is the formation of a viable embryo where we make all the major organ system beginnings. So a series of cell divisions are going to subdivide the zygote into what we call a um, blastocyst. And the blastocyst has three parts, a trophoblast, an inner cell mass, and what's called a blastocele. So I would like to show you these because it'll make a little bit more sense if we can actually visualize this. This figure here is on page 1092 of your textbook. It's figure 29-2. And just to orient you to the picture, here we're looking at the corner of the uterus. Okay, so here's the fundus of the uterus here. We can see the lumen of the uterus right here, the uterine cavity and then the fallopian tube or uterine tube going this way, fimbriae, which are those finger-like projections, and then we have the ovary here, and what we can see is that the egg has just popped out of the ovary, and we have left behind a corpus luteum, um, which is going to produce progesterone to thicken up the endometrium of the uterus. So the egg is swept into the fallopian tube by those fimbriae. The fimbriae actually kind of wave like this and make a suction. And that suction will pull the egg in and the egg will begin to float down the fallopian tube. As we saw, the egg will be met with sperm and this one of the sperm will penetrate. 30 hours after fertilization, we have our very first cell division, so we're a two-celled organism. As the fertilized egg begins to move toward the uterus, it continues to divide. Four cells, six cells, eight cells, twelve cells, so on and so forth, until we get to be very, very complex, and more and more complex all the time. This, on day three, we have what's called a marula. A marula is a solid ball of cells. The word marula means mulberry, and it kind of does look a little bit like a mulberry. If you've never seen a mulberry, it's kind of like a raspberry or blackberry. It's got all these little bumps all over it. So the early marula is a um, solid ball of cells. And then we have an advanced marula, which is even more complex, solid ball of cells. And on day six, approximately, when we just begin to enter the uterus, we have what's called a blastocyst. Blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells. A hollow ball of cells. And there are three main parts to the blastocyst. We have the outer membrane, which is called the trophoblast. We have the inner cell mass, and this little blob of cells here is what's going to become the fetus. So even though it looks, doesn't look like much, it's the most important part of this blastocyst. Then we have this hollow inside here, which is called the blastocele. Trophoblast, inner cell mass, and blastocele. Okay, so this is around day six. Now when we say day six, remember day 14 of our 28-day cycle is when we ovulated. So after ovulation, six days after ovulation, we are still about a week away from day 28, which would be when we would expect our period to come. So we're going to follow this little blastocyst, and that blastocyst is going to eventually drop into the uterus and land 
on the rich, thick, oxygen-filled endometrial lining where it will burrow in, implant itself, and begin making an embryo. So implantation occurs about seven days after fertilization. This is when the trophoblast enlarges and mother's blood will wash around the blastocyst through open lacunae. Okay, and I'll show you this as well in a picture. Then we have the major process known as gastrulation. Gastrulation is the formation of the embryonic disc that's made up of germinative layers, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. So let's take a look at that. So here we go. This is all endometrium, the lining of the uterus. The blastocyst, or hollow ball of cells, has just dropped into the uterine cavity, and it will land on the endometrium and begin to burrow into the endometrial tissue. As it does this, little pockets will open up in the endometrial tissue, and mother's blood will wash around the blastocyst, delivering oxygen and nutrients to it. This washing of blood can also sometimes cause light spotting, which is known as implantation bleeding. It's so incredibly light that most women don't notice it, and we're still about a week away from your missed period. So as we get to around day 10, 10 days after ovulation, so we're about at day 24, we can see that the blastocyst is beginning to change. It's begin to, been, beginning to go through gastrulation, which is the development of those three germ layers, the endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. So let's take this one little section right here and blow this up a little bit more so that we can see what's actually going on right here. So this is on page 1094 of your textbook. We're looking a little closer at the blastocyst. So day 10, this is about day 24 of your cycle. You're still about four days away from your missed period. And we're looking down on the blastocyst. All of this around here is endometrial tissue. And this is the blastocyst. Now, what we've developed now is a yolk sac, kind of like what we recognize the yolk sac in a chicken's egg, but it's not exactly the same, of course. And then we have an amniotic cavity, as you can imagine, that's going to contain amniotic fluid. And then in between, we have two layers of cells. The formation of these layers of cells is what we call gastrulation. Those two layers of cells will develop a third middle layer. So around day 12, we're going to end up with three layers of cells. We have the ectoderm, mesoderm, meaning middle, and endoderm, meaning innermost. The mesoderm is formed because the ectoderm actually folds in on itself and creates the mesoderm. Now, there's no way we have time to really get into these three layers, but I do want you to understand the significance of them. Um, those three layers are what we call embryonic stem cells. And you may, may have heard that embryonic stem cell research is extremely controversial. And the reason is um, that in order to get embryonic stem cells, which are cells that can become anything just about, we have to remove them from this area here. And if we remove those cells, it's going to stop the development of the fetus. So if you are not a proponent of ending the life of an embryo this, this early, or if you do not consider this a life yet, then you might not be bothered by this. If you consider the union of an egg and a sperm right at that very moment we have a life, then this would be something that you would find difficult to support most likely. These three layers here, um, again, are the germ layers of gastrulation. And again, I mentioned we don't have enough time to cover it. What I mean by that is there is a 
graduate level course called embryology. And all you do for 16 weeks is study those three layers. That's how incredibly complex they are, which we certainly do not have time to go into. But I would like you to look on page 1095 of your textbook just to see why those three layers are so critical. To give you an idea, the ectoderm will make the integument, the skeletal system, nervous, endocrine, respiratory, digestive. The mesoderm will make the dermis and hypodermis, skeletal system, muscular system, endocrine system, cardiovascular, lymphoid, urinary, reproductive. Endoderm, endocrine system, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and other aspects of reproductive. So the, those three layers of cells, though they don't look like much, are going to become every major cell and organ in the human body. So they must be left alone in order to develop the fetus correctly. So those three layers are going to originate um, or be the origin of all of the major organs and tissues of the, the fetus, of the developing embryo and fetus. So by day 12, surface cells move toward what's called the primitive streak and form a third germ layer, the mesoderm. The three germ layers are the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. There are also four extra embryonic membranes, the yolk sac, amnion, allantois, and the chorion. So I'll point these out to you in a picture and then we'll define what they do shortly. Okay, day 14, this is 14 days after ovulation and this would be the day if you are very regular you would be expecting your period. So what we can see here at day 14, this is all endometrial tissue here and then we have the blastocyst and the blastocyst, the blastocele, is starting to become much larger. We can see the yolk sac, the amnion, where the amniotic sac is going to be. Week three, this is a week after your missed period, so you might probably be starting to wonder now why you haven't gotten your period. We can see that the blastocele has gotten even bigger. We have the yolk sac there, the amnion, the allantois, and the chorion. So one thing to point out, a couple things to point out actually, the yolk sac here, this is a very important site of red blood cell formation. The amniotic sac of course is going to hold the amniotic fluid. The allantois is going to form the infant's bladder. And then this area around here, the chorion, is what makes up the placenta, which is why it's so significant. It's this kind of pinkish red membrane that's going around the inside there. And we can start to see how the, the cells of the germ layers are beginning to form kind of a head looking area and a backbone and sort of a tail area. Week four, this is two weeks after missed period, we can see things are continuing to change significantly. The yolk sac is starting to get a little smaller. We can see the amnion is even larger. We've got a head fold, a body fold, and a tail fold. And then what's starting to look a little bit like this could be an umbilical cord. And then around here we have the chorion, which is going to be the placenta that houses, protects, and nourishes the fetus. Week five, we can see the uterus um, is still not filled yet, so there would be, you'd absolutely not be showing in any way, shape, or form at this point. Um, and by the way, these pictures are on page 1096 of your textbook. We can see the head, body, and tail fold there, yolk sac, the umbilical stump that's starting to form, and then the chorion, again what makes up the placenta, which we'll look at a little closer in a minute. And you can see the cervix is closed down here. It definitely should not be open yet. 
So at week 10, the amnion has expanded greatly, filling up the uterine cavity, and the fetus is now connected to an umbilical cord which connects it to the placental sac. That placental sac is going to be the main source of all nutrients and oxygen for the baby. We can see the yolk sac is kind of atrophying now. It's much, much smaller. And we can definitely see recognizable human features at this phase. So the yolk sac is a really important site of blood cell formation. The amnion encloses fluid that's going to cushion, surround, and shock absorb for the developing embryo. The allantois will eventually become the bladder, and the chorion is the network of blood vessels that makes up the placental sac that houses the baby. So this picture here, which is on page 1097 of your textbook, is a picture of the uterus with the placenta sac still in it, but there's no baby in there. They've taken the baby out so we can see a little bit closer. Um, a lot of people think that mother and baby share blood, and this is actually definitely not true, because the baby could have dad's blood type. If the baby has dad's blood type and mom has a different blood type than the baby, then if the mom and baby's blood mix, this could cause serious problems, kill the mother or even the baby. So. Mom and baby do not share blood. What actually happens is this. The baby is enclosed within the placental sac in amniotic fluid. Now obviously the baby cannot breathe through his or her nose and mouth at this phase because they are suspended in fluid. It'd be like you trying to breathe underwater. But the baby is connected to the placenta by the umbilical cord, which is kind of like a a scuba hose. Um, so they're attached to this little hose and they're able to breathe and get nourishment through this little scuba hose. So what's actually happening is the placenta, if you look closely here you can see blood vessels. These blood vessels fill the umbilical cord and go right into the baby. Those blood vessels then grow into the placenta so we can see all these blood vessels here that are part of the placenta. Those blood vessels, which are called the chorion, grow into the endometrial tissue of the uterus. They grow into the lining of the uterus, almost like a root system. The mother then bleeds around the placenta, so her blood washes around the placenta. Her blood never crosses over and touches the baby. It just bleeds around the placenta, and the placenta, like a root system, absorbs oxygen and nutrients from the mother's blood without allowing the blood to mix. So if we take a close-up view right here, okay, this is the chorion of the placenta. Here's the mother's uterine lining tissue here, the endometrium, and we can see her bleeding around the placenta. So she's constantly washing blood around the placenta and the baby's placental sac is allowing or is grabbing, like a little root system, grabbing oxygen and nutrients and pulling them through the little scuba hose right into the baby. So this is all happening by diffusion where the blood does not actually have to mix. So this allows the baby to have dad's blood type possibly which could be a completely different blood type than mom's because the blood types do not mix. This is also why sometimes pregnant women think that they're having a period. Sometimes this bleeding around the placenta, the blood can actually drain down and come out through the cervix and cause spotting during pregnancy, which can be extremely scary. Um, but it is not actually a period, it's just the rundown of the blood from this washing of blood process across the placenta. So the chorionic villi extend into maternal tissue and form an intricate branching network for the maternal blood, and the umbilical cord connects the fetus to the placenta. Um, and if any of you have had babies, especially naturally, then you 
have probably seen the placenta, which comes out after the baby, and it is very unattractive. It's a big sack of blood vessels. Um, if you have C-section, you probably never saw it, but it is what the baby, of course, is suspended in and protected by. This is a picture of it. Again, really, really unattractive looking. It's just a big sack of blood vessels, and we can see there the umbilical cord coming off of that placental sac which the baby was once in but you can see all the blood vessels those are the blood vessels that were grabbing nutrients and oxygen from mom and delivering them straight into the baby so the placenta releases several important hormones the first one is hcg um, hcg is the pregnancy hormone this is the hormone that we pick up on on an over-the-counter pregnancy test that you urinate on. Um, HCG again, human chorionic gonadotropin. Um, obviously you know how to spell human. Chorionic is C-H-O-R-I-O-N-I-C. Gonadotropin, G-O-N-A-D-O-T-R-O-P-I-N. Human chorionic gonadotropin. And human chorionic gonadotropin is going to do a few major things. Um, one of the main things that it's going to do is it's going to help maintain the corpus luteum. And it's also going to help the endometrium stay intact. As well as it suppresses the mother's immune system so that she does not reject the pregnancy. Um, and this spike in HCG can actually be why women the first few weeks of pregnancy actually feel sick like they have the flu because their immune system is suppressed. They can have body aches, nausea, slight fever, um, muscle cramps, and extreme tiredness as a result of these hormones. Estrogen um, is going to play a role in labor and delivery. It's going to actually help uterine contractions which we'll get to in a little bit. Progesterone is going to, we've already talked about it, it's going to um, thicken the uterine lining in preparation for pregnancy. It also slows down digestion to help the pregnant mother absorb more nutrients than usual. And um, it is also going to, um, it can, well, it does a few things, some of it I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the main thing you need to know right now is just that it's going to thicken the uterine lining, slow down digestion, um, and we'll save the rest for a little bit later on. It, it's going to quiet the uterus. Um, in, in other words, it's going to keep it from moving around too much, keep it from contracting. Um, so it sort of just quiets the, the movements and contractions of the uterus to keep it still so the baby can develop without any kind of movement because the uh, uterus in a non-pregnant female is constantly contracting. We can't feel it, but it's happening all the time. And then we have HPL, which is human placental lactogen. Human placental lactogen. This is going to prepare the mammary glands for milk production. And then placental prolactin is going to help the effects of lactogen. Relaxin will soften the pubic symphysis, which will allow the pelvis to expand so that the baby's head can pass through dur during childbirth. This is also what, what, what can make the hips wider after pregnancy because the hips never tend to fuse back quite the same as they once were before the baby. Okay, so once we finish the first trimester, we're heading into the second trimester, and the first trimester all the rudiments of the organ systems are fully formed. In the second and third trimester, um, the second trimester, the organs are going to become more complex. So the organs will increase in complexity. And the third trimester, many organ systems become fully functional. And the fetus will undergo the largest weight change. At the end of gestation, the fetus and uterus will push maternal organs out of position. So in this picture here, which we can see on page 1103, um, 
This is a 16 week pregnancy. Look how tiny that little uterus is and how tiny that little baby is. Over here we can see the height of the uterus as pertains to the month. So all the way up to the ninth month, the uterus has, has greatly changed. Um, it is many times its original size and um, has to dramatically increase in order to hold the baby and all the amniotic fluids. You can see from three months to nine months there's a magnanimous change in the size of the uterus. Um, just to give you some, some ideas, in, this, in the last three months of gestation the fetus will gain um, anywhere from about 5 to 5.7 pounds on average in the third trimester um, <clears throat> and a typical uterus undergoes such a huge increase in size that it actually pushes the um, maternal organs out of position which is, can be extremely uncomfortable in the ninth month. We can see that here. This is a non-pregnant female. Here's the liver, stomach, intestines and there's the cute little bitty tiny uterus vaginal canal and got the bladder right there and then look at this I mean this is just ridiculous that this ever even works but we can see the poor little cervix right there that massive uterus there's that sad little bladder being pressed on by that giant baby head and look at the intestines how they're completely crammed up underneath the rib cage. No wonder it's so uncomfortable, you know, if you think about it. Because the baby's taking up so much space, the organs can't be where they normally are. So during pregnancy, the mother has to change a lot. Um, her respiratory rate is going to go up because, of course, she's breathing for two. Um, so she has to take in extra oxygen to deliver to the baby. The mother's tidal volume increases. Her blood volume will go up by 50%. Nutrient and vitamin uptake, of course. Um, now, I hate to say it, because I understand, but when you're pregnant, a lot of times people tell you you're eating for two, and you tell yourself, I'm eating for two, so I need to eat 16 helpings of chocolate cake. Well, even though we may feel that way, which again, totally understand, guilty as charged, but a typical gynecologist or OBGYN will tell you that we only need to take in about a banana's worth of extra calories a day during pregnancy, which is nothing. Most of us will eat much more than that, um, but we tend to get the dangerous idea in our head that we need to eat for two people, but when your baby's the size of a peanut, you really can't and shouldn't be eating for two people. Though again, when you don't feel well and you're nauseous and you finally feel like eating, I totally understand the desire to eat whatever you want to eat. Finally, the GFR or glomerular filtration rate is going to go up. And this makes sense because um, if we have a 50% increase in blood volume, that means 50% more blood to filter by the kidneys, which means the kidneys are going to have to work harder and they're going to be producing more urine. So not only do we have more urine produced during pregnancy, but we've also got that baby head pressing on the bladder, which means it can't get very full before we feel like we have to run to the bathroom. Progesterone inhibits uterine muscle contraction, which is opposed by estrogen, oxytocin, and prostaglandin. Um, those three hormones will stimulate uterine contractions, estrogen, oxytocin, and prostaglandin. Alright, so labor and delivery. The stages of labor are dilation, expulsion, and placental. The dilation stage begins when um, we start having some mild contractions. Um, it's variable in length, but it can last for eight or more hours. The labor contractions can last up to half a minute every 10 to 30 minutes. The frequency will increase, and the water will eventually break during this phase. 
Now what we want to happen is we want the uterus to dilate to at least 10 centimeters across. And I should have a picture here for you. Okay, so here we can see this is, this is when the cervix is not dilated. So here's the cervix and there's the vaginal canal. You can see the baby's head is in position. And here we have a cervix dilated to one centimeter. You see across there, that's the dilation, one centimeter. Here's a cervix dilated to five centimeters. And then there, we have a fully dilated cervix at 10 centimeters. So you can see where it would be not easy, mind you, but much easier for the baby's head to pass through than in this situation, which would be impossible. So expulsion is the second phase, which is um, once dilation is complete. Um, in this stage, contractions reach maximum intensity, occurring two to three minute intervals, lasting a full minute. Now once expulsion is finished, we have the placental stage, which is very short, and this is the um, removal of the placenta. So in this picture here we can see the phases of labor and delivery which is on page 1106 of your textbook. Um, here this is before dilation. You can see the cervix is very very closed and as we start getting into the dilation phase um, we can see that the cervix is fully dilated and the baby's head is dropped into position. In the expulsion phase, the baby's head begins to emerge, the baby's pushed out, and then we have the placental stage where the afterbirth or placenta is ejected. So some other labor and delivery situations that may be difficult is we first have premature labor, and this is when labor begins before the fetus completes normal development. Um, now, depending on how early and how, how heavy the baby is can depend on how successful the baby will be. Um, typically, when a, baby is less, when a baby is less than 14 ounces at birth, there is no chance of survival. Um, now, as the baby gets a little bit older, closer to around 28 weeks, um, typically the baby weighs a little, a little bit over a pound. Um, there's certainly a chance of survival. Most fetuses born between 25 and 27 weeks um, will, have, will have a rough time, but with, with care they could potentially survive with some possibility of some abnormalities of development. Um, after 28 weeks, there's a much better chance of survival if the baby weighs over 2.2 pounds. Um, difficult deliveries when the fetus faces the pubis rather than the sacrum, um, which we, we refer to as sunny side up. Um, if the baby is face up rather than face down, this, this can make childbirth a little bit more complicated. Um, because of the curve of the sacrum here, if the baby is face up, this causes the chin to kind of press into the chest of the baby, which the baby can be delivered this way, it just typically takes longer. If the baby's face down, this is easier on the baby's neck and a little bit easier to push the baby out that way. Breech births is when the legs or buttocks enter the vaginal canal first, which is not a good idea. Um, these will result in C-sections these days. But if the legs are face down, okay, like we can see here, this is a breech, this is a normal uh, placement of the baby with the head down. This is a breech birth where the buttocks or legs are face down instead of the head. And the problem with this is the cervix will dilate to fit whatever is touching it. So if the legs are face down, the cervix will only dilate to uh, accommodate the legs, which may not be wide enough for the head to be removed or to, be, to pass through. So if the baby is born legs first, then the cervix may actually squeeze the baby's neck and could potentially suffocate the baby, or the baby could have the umbilical cord wrapped around its neck and that could also suffocate it. So it is a much riskier way of delivering a baby, which is why these result in C-sections. 
multiple births, twins or triplets. There is a difference between fraternal and identical twins. Um, fraternal twins are also known as dizygotic. This is when a mother releases two eggs at the same time and each one is fertilized by a different sperm. So dizygotic or fraternal twins are no more related than regular siblings. So if you have a brother or sister, it would be like the two of you being incubated and born on the same day. You're two different eggs, two different sperm. You're still related, but you're not identical to each other. Monozygotic is identical twins. This is when one egg is fertilized and it copies itself. So the twins are born with the same genetic information, meaning that if they did a DNA test, they would have the same DNA, same fingerprints, everything would be exactly the same, which is why they look the same. Now, women who have dizygotic twins, as bizarre as it sounds, a woman can release two eggs during ovulation. Each one is fertilized independently. It has actually happened before where a woman has had fraternal twins with two different fathers. She's released two eggs and had intercourse with two different men in the same day and the sperm are mixed together and the two siblings are born the same day but they have different fathers which is extremely bizarre but entirely possible. Postnatal development. So postnatal life stages, um, we have the neonatal period, which is birth to one month. Infancy, which is <clears throat> one month to two years. Childhood, two years. Until puberty, which is when we get to adolescence. Adolescence lasts through puberty. And then we have maturity. And maturity begins with senescence and ends, or senescence begins at maturity and ends in death, which is a very depressing statement, but it's basically saying maturity begins with aging and ends in death. The neonatal period from birth to one month, this is when the respiratory, circulatory, digestive, and urinary systems must adjust and begin to work on their own. The infant must learn to thermoregulate, which means maintain his or her own body temperature. For the first few days after birth, the mother releases colostrum, which is a kind of a yellowish secretion that comes out before breast milk. Um, it's low in fat and very high in antibodies. It gives the baby a wonderful immune system start. And a few days after the colostrum is released, we have milk production, which is much higher in fat um, and also very high in nutrients and water as well. Both secretions are released via the milk letdown reflex. So we'll take a look at the milk letdown reflex, which is on page 1109 of your textbook. So the milk letdown reflex begins with stimulation of the nipple by the baby. The baby latches on to the nipple and this sends a message to the spinal cord which propagates up to the brain, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland then releases oxytocin and oxytocin causes the ejection of milk not only does it cause the ejection of milk, but it also causes uterine contractions, which is why some women say while they're breastfeeding, they can actually feel their uterus contracting. And this is a good thing because breastfeeding not only is wonderful for the baby's health, but it also uh, burns a ton of calories for the mother, so it helps her get back, at, back into normal shape quicker. And it also, because it causes uterine contractions, will help the uterus return back to shape fairly, fairly quickly in comparison to not breastfeeding because the uterus is just a big muscle so if it's contracting it's almost like working out. Now this is to show how incredibly out of proportion babies are. Um, if you have a baby or toddler at home, do this. 
ask them to raise their arms up over their head. Now an adult, if you raise your arm up over your head right now, straight up to the ceiling, you'll notice that the top of your head aligns approximately with your elbow. If you ask a toddler to do this, the toddler's little fingertips meet about the top of the head. So they are really out of proportion. Babies and toddlers and little kids, their heads are gigantic. And they grow into those giant heads, which is actually very normal. But if we look at this picture here, here's a fetus at 16 weeks. Look at that massive head in comparison to the rest of the body. Same thing here, newborn, giant head, six-year-old, huge head. We grow into our head. And so I have some sample pictures here of babies, of students that I've had. This is an example of how horribly out of proportion babies are. But we can see that with the little arms above the head, that the tips of the fingers are just above the head, unlike the way it is in an adult. So if you would like your baby to be a part of the Big Headed Baby slideshow, please send me a picture of your baby in that position through my email and I'll add you to PowerPoint. So adolescence begins at puberty, which is the period of sexual maturation and ends when growth is completed. Now puberty obviously happens at different ages for different people. Girls typically enter it before boys. Puberty is marked by an increased production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, an increase in FSH and LH. The ovaries and testes become sensitive to FSH and LH. Gamete production begins, sex hormones are produced, and growth rate increases. These differences will be retained throughout life and adolescence will continue until growth is completed. Further changes happen when sex hormones decline, like in menopause and the male climacteric, which we talked about in chapter 28. This is just a bit of genetic review at the end of the chapter here. Every body cell, every somatic cell, carries copies of the 46 original chromosomes in the zygote. Genotype is what chromosomes you have, and phenotype is your physical expression, what you look like based on your chromosomes. Somatic or body cells contain 23 pairs, which is 46 chromosomes. 22 pairs, or 44 of those chromosomes, are what are called autosomes, and one pair is the sex chromosomes. Chromosomes contain DNA and genes are segments of DNA. This is a picture of a mapping of human chromosomes. There are 46 total here. The last group is the sex chromosomes. And if you remember, the male chromosomes are XY, so this is a male. Female chromosomes are XX. So male XY, female XX. X chromosomes carry sex-linked diseases like colorblindness, and this is why men are more often um, afflicted with colorblindness. And the reason is, if a man receives a defective gene on his X chromosome, he only has one X chromosome, so whatever is on it, he is going to express. Females, if we get a color blindness gene on one X chromosome, we still have another X chromosome that can be dominant and snuff out the bad gene. So in order for a female to have partial or complete color blindness, she has to receive the color blindness gene from both her mother and her father, which is much less likely. The Human Genome Project came out in 2001 and it was supposed to be a groundbreaking, life-changing event. 
it mapped out more than 38,000 of our genes, including some that are responsible for inherited disorders. This is a map of the Human Genome Project, and the reason it was so exciting at the time was that scientists actually were able to locate where many diseases were found, what chromosomes they were on. For example, ovarian cancer on chromosome number 9, diabetes on chromosome number 10, sickle cell anemia, chromosome 11, Alzheimer's disease, Tay-Sachs, Down syndrome, hemophilia, muscular dystrophy. We found where all these diseases were located. So the hope was maybe one day we'd be able to go in, snip out the defective gene, replace it with a healthy one. But unfortunately we have not been able to do that thus far and there seems to be a lot more to our genetic makeup than just what we originally thought. And this concludes chapter 29.